Hi guys, do you know it's been 34 years since Toyota introduced the Lexus brand to the world with the LS400? Yep, that came out in September 1989. And to commemorate that, I've been looking back and trying to find the original review that I did on that car, which I found, and I'll tell you what I said right after this. A brown car guy. Brown car guy. Yeah, so 34 years since Toyota basically changed the game with the LS400. I mean, it cannot be overstated in any way just how much of an important car this was not just for Toyota but actually for the Japanese car industry as a whole because until that point the European car industry kind of looked down its nose a little bit at the Japanese car industry and thought well you know they make these nice little economical runabouts but they can't really match us when it comes to sports cars which of course Honda changed the game with the NSX when they took it right to the top league and rivaled the likes of Ferrari with the NSX but of course before that the luxury sector and the luxury sector of course you know were dominated by the likes of Mercedes and BMW and then of course comes Lexus which would which you know which I'll come to in a minute but for a lot of people uh, they thought that well it was a bit of a clone of a Mercedes but it was so much more than that in fact even before Lexus had come out with the LS400 Honda had actually launched the first legend that was actually predates the Lexus so that was actually Japan's first attempt and while it didn't quite hit the mark but it was damn close in fact I remember reading at the time when the Honda Legend came out that there were crisis meetings in in, in Germany at the uh, at the likes of uh, Mercedes and BMW when they actually got hold of the car and took it for a drive and they came back and they thought yeah we better have a sit down conversation about this car and that of course got even more um, substantial when the LS400 arrived. So the LS400, like I said, it came out in September 1989. I reviewed this review I did in March 1990 and this was for Arab News in Jeddah in Saudi Arabia. Um, I often say that I was Saudi Arabia's first motoring journalist. Started back in 1989, first writing for the Saudi Gazette and then for the Arab News, which were the two main English daily newspapers in the country at the time and in fact now as well and uh, although the Lexus LS400 had actually been introduced and launched in Saudi Arabia in November 1989 so about two months after the rest of the world but while a few cars were there they didn't really start deliveries and sales uh, until March in 1990 which is when I got this car so at the time when I wrote this review, uh, one of the things, for example, um, that I looked into at the time and I wrote in the article, Toyota says it took six years, 2,300 technicians, 1,400 engineers, 450 prototypes and 4.3 million kilometers of testing to conceive the LS400. Now that is staggering way, way back then. And what did it amount to? Now the biggest problem with the Toyota, because even before the, or the Lexus I should say, because even before the Lexus LS400 had arrived in the Saudi market, of course, there had been a lot of press and media about this car globally, globally, because it was a worldwide thing that they were doing. And there was all this talk of Toyota launching a brand new brand that was going to be a luxury brand. And the prices, the idea of the price started to circulate. Even I remember in Jeddah at the time and everybody was like, nah, nobody's going to pay that much money for a Toyota. So how much money were we talking? Well, at the time, according to that review, it was 140,000 Saudi Rials. That would have equated to about 30,000 pounds or $36,000. Um, and in the market, again, according to this review, it, at that price point, it rivaled the likes of the Mercedes 230CE and the BMW 525i, as well as the Lincoln Continental, if you wanted to bring an American luxury car into that. And the Lincoln Continental at the time was actually quite a big seller in Saudi Arabia. Just to give you a snapshot of the luxury car segment in Saudi Arabia, you had a very distinct uh, hierarchy. I mean, forget like the roles and stuff like that, but pretty much at the top of the three, at the three sat the Mercedes S-Class. 
And the way it kind of worked at the time, uh, depending on how well you were in the company or if it was a private, most Emiratis or Saudis, I should say, were driving. The reason I say that is because I lived in the UAE as well after that. But at the time, I should say Saudis, most Saudis would have bought themselves either a, a Mercedes S-Class or a Buick Park Avenue. And that's pretty much how it went until uh, Ford came in with the Lincoln and the Lincoln Continental kind of rivaled the Buick Park Avenue. And then below that you had things like the Caprice Classic and uh, the Toyota Cressida and et cetera, et cetera. That's how it went, uh, that's on Nissan Laurels and things like that. So with this car, we're talking at the time, uh, 140,000 real. Now translate that into today's money, you know, looking at inflation and everything, that would probably be around 245,000 Saudi reals. So that's what that would be today. So again, to put it into context, that would be about 54,000 pounds or about $65,000. So that's kind of what you would get. But again, thinking back, uh, back to what other cars at rivals, such as the Mercedes 230, or the 525, we're talking 2.5 liter engine for the BMW, but this thing came with a four liter V8 with 32 valves, 260 brake horsepower, which was delivered at 5,600 RPM. Now this engine, before I get into the performance stats, this engine was so highly regarded in terms of its durability, its robustness, its refinement, its smoothness. It was just considered to be extraordinary that it was actually used in other applications such as for small airplanes. And it, the same engine was used. And even today, it's one of the, the great engines from Toyota. So it was an extraordinary, extraordinary thing. In the car, it delivered, like I said, 260 brake horsepower, but it was a big car. And that actually gave it a zero to 62 miles per hour acceleration, acceleration time of about 8.5 seconds, and it would reach about 150 miles per hour. And it did that through a four speed, yes, just a four speed automatic. I know we talk about eight, nine speed automatics these days, but at the time, four speed was actually, you know, remember, we were coming off the back of three speed gearboxes, not, not that far before then. So four speed, uh, and it was, regard, they, they said at the time, it was a computer managed uh, four speed automatic gearbox box you know which basically has got engine management system is what it actually had but even at the time it was incredibly seamless I mean when I drove this thing you, the changes were almost imperceptible unless you switched into the other mode they were actually even back then that gearbox had two modes so it had a, a normal mode and then it had a power mode and the power was basically for sports and, and that's what gave you a little bit more um, of a kick there and the thing also had ABS so it had anti-lock brakes so you know, this thing really um, had quite a lot of kit in it, but of course it had this very smooth contoured looks with the big imposing grille and the large headlights at the front. So I remember at the time before this car had actually reached the market, I had shown the picture around to a load of people because <clears throat> I used to get mags and stuff like that. So I had the pictures and I would go around and show it to people and say, you know, what is this car? Because at the time, people, this was before it had arrived, so people didn't know what it was. So I would show it to people and say, what is this car? And most people would say it's a Mercedes. So that, that was a sort of, you know, you put your thumb over the badge or whatever. Nobody would know what the badge was anyway, because nobody was familiar with the Lexus name at the time. But the perception was it's a Mercedes. And even when it arrived, a lot of people thought, you know, it's a little bit of a Mercedes clone. And to be fair, it was as wide as an S-Class, although it was slightly smaller, it was shorter. It was about, uh, I think about 25 millimeters shorter than a Mercedes. But it was packed full of kid. And this was standard. So that's what you got for your 140,000 reals at the time. This was standard. It came with memory, memory, 10-way power adjustable uh, front seats. It had a power adjustable steering column. Um, it had seat belt anchors that were also adjustable. And, they, and all of these were memory. So all of these sort of, when you got in the car, they sort of adjusted themselves. It had this incredible blacked out instrument panel. I remember that sort of really, you know, took my breath away when you got on it and you just didn't see anything until you turned on the key. And then it kind of came to life. And what Toyota described that as a vacuum fluorescent lighting system that was basically projecting the display onto the panel. Uh, it was extraordinary. And even the rear view mirror at the time. So you remember rear view mirrors, they would just have that little uh, toggle switch, which, you know, adjust it for nighttime viewing. But this thing had a digital aspect to it, which you could manually adjust to how much, you know, you wanted to reduce the glare from uh, headlights behind you. It, it, it did that all the way back then. Um, in addition to that, um, the, you know, the list goes on because it had uh, leather upholstery, 
as a standard but actually you could get cloth upholstery as a zero cost option if you wanted to and of course in the heat of the middle east some people would actually prefer not to have leather and prefer to have the um the cloth but actually not necessary because it actually had a one of the earliest forms of climate control so it obviously had air conditioning and it was known for good air conditioning but it had climate control so you could vary the front and the rear of the cabin so it had all of those systems in it um seven speaker seven speaker at the time that was a lot i know we've got tons more speakers these days in luxury cars but seven speaker at the time was a lot seven speaker cassette radio and cd player and had a six uh cd interchanger in the boot of course that was a very cool thing to have at that time and all of this was delivered i mean the sound of that sound quality of that was tremendous a lot of bass brilliant rich rich sound but also benefiting from the fact that you were kind of isolated from exterior sounds and how did they do that by what they called at the time unique resin filled sandwich steel sheets wow so they, they were really you know this is when this car came out and it was quieter than the jag it was quieter than the rolls royce you know it literally it set new standards of refinement and smoothness with this thing by the time we got it in saudi arabia 16,000 of them had already been sold in america and in fact, I think if I recall correctly, there was a famously a recall that happened within the first couple of months of this car being delivered. And a lot of people immediately thought, ah, that's it, you know, they've blown it. This recall is going to kill them. But actually, no, because the quality of the dealership was as good. I mean, I know that in Saudi Arabia, for example, it was still a Toyota dealer, but they had upped the game just for the Lexus brand. So the quality of service that people got from Lexus, you know, the fact that when they had the recall, it was handled immediately, promptly, efficiently, and everybody felt like they had been well looked after, that it actually enhanced the brand. So it was an example of how to take something that people thought, you know, would scupper their efforts, but actually turn it into a positive and actually build a lasting relationship. And as, as we know that Lexus owners are now extremely loyal to the brand and you can't uh, really blame them for that either. One thing that they did in uh, Saudi Arabia, I remember at the time, was very cleverly. So again, like I said, the car had arrived in November, but really didn't go on sale until March the following year. But the first sort of batch of cars that they had got, I think it was Abdul Latif Jamil, was the Toyota dealership. And what they'd done is they seeded those cars with sort of the, you know, today you'd call them influencers. Of course, then there was no social media, but they would be the key people and the sort of local community that were known as car guys or car people or aficionados or sort of the community, the, the, the people that other people would sort of gravitate towards if they wanted buying advice or, or information about cars. And they seeded these cars out to these people and said, basically, here, take the car, it's yours for a week, 10 days, month, whatever, you know, enjoy it, whatever, let us know what you think of it. And of course, you know, people would be like, oh, okay, why am I going to get out of my S class and get into one of these? But it's almost like to a person, they all bought their cars. And that was that did it. That did it because the word of mouth immediately got out that this is something very special. It's more refined. It's quieter. It's better. You know than 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 what was out there at the time. So that really really did um, did it a huge ton of favors, and that's kind of where they really escalated the sales of that car. And of course, also they also introduced a finance system which was again something that was unusual in the Saudi market because it was a cash-based market and they would just, people would just turn up with wads of money and say, right, I want this car. And they introduced a finance system. So not only uh, locals, but also you know, expats could start to look at buying those cars, sort of obviously senior executive level people. So at the time in the review, it's quite interesting because I write about how impressive its performance is. I mean, by today's standards, 8.5 seconds is nothing. But back then for a big bruiser like that, 8.5 seconds in serenity was quite a substantial thing. But I remember writing even in this, I was reading it through and it says that, well, it's more of a cruiser. It's, you know, it's not something you want to throw around, but it just kind of, it's, it's an easy drive. It's extremely comfortable, extremely refined, extremely smooth, you know, but you're not, not necessarily like the, the V8 is quite subdued, but you can hear it. I, all of that is mentioned in the review. So at the time, clearly I thought of it as more of a luxury executive express rather than um, a sports saloon. But having said that, fast forward, um, you know, something like maybe, uh, well, a couple of decades, really. Um, uh, I would say 15, 60 years, 1990. I moved out to the UAE in 2006. So you could say, yeah, pretty much around 2010, 2011. You know, I was still seeing these cars, particularly outside of Dubai. I'm talking a first generation LS 400. Outside of Dubai, when you, when we did car reviews, we take a bunch of cars outside to do a photo shoot and stuff like that. 
um, off around the East Coast or Kalba or Fajera or whatever. And you still see a lot of young Emirati kids rocking around in LS400. They obviously like second, third um, hand cars, but they would buy them because they were still solid. They were still tough. They still had, they were still comfortable, but also that power, I don't know if they'd up the power or something, you know, it wouldn't be surprising, but they, you know, they turn up and they do a bunch of donuts and drift around us and stuff like that, wave, smile, and they just wanted us to cheer and clap them and then they would just drive off again, you know. Um, and, it, and so it was still, I mean, it might, for all I know, they might still be rocking around. It's been a few years since, but such a solid machine. And I think really, if, there, if you can find one of these now, in the UK, they aren't that common. They're extremely rare. But if you can find one, get it and hold on to it because this is definitely a classic and a collectible worthy of a place in the museum of the future. What an amazing car. Let me know if you ever owned one or if you ever experienced one and what your memories of it were in the comments below and I'll see you all in the next video. Brown car guy. Hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, please, please hit the like button and share this video as well if you can. And while you're at it, check out these guys who also sponsor my content. I am deeply grateful to them because it helps me to buy new equipment, put fuel in the cars, and yes, buy a cup of coffee. You can do the same, just go here or right here on YouTube. Just hit these three little dots down here and click on thanks. Make sure you're signed in first. My content is free, but this is how you can help me keep it that way. I may even send you a gift. Oh, by the way, watch this next.